So if we were to do an autopsy of the brain and cut it in half, you wouldn't see little white pieces of printed paper with your social security number on it, but you know that you have that inside your mind. And we wouldn't see a map of New Jersey, but you may live there and you kind of know your way around. I left a comment on an ADHD uh, account that posted a video. It kind of highlighted how as soon as your Adderall or your ADHD meds kick in, you could even have a sandwich in your hands and all of a sudden it's like, nah, I'm not hungry anymore. I don't have an appetite. So I left a quick comment explaining the emotional components. And uh, this woman here replied to me saying this, since Adderall increases the amount of dopamine released in the brain and dopamine helps send signals when the body is satisfied from food, the Adderall is sending messages to the body is full when actually it is not. This can then lead to weight loss because a person will not eat if they're not hungry. It has nothing to do with interest. And she goes, that's not how stimulants work. It has nothing to do with interest and everything to do with metabolic appetite. And I figured this was an amazing opportunity for me to create a, um, a video on the, the brain mind interface because it is mental health awareness week. And one of our big blocks to understanding human behavior and mental health has been that the scientific community has almost exclusively um, just focused on the brain. We all have historically thought that the mind is something esoteric, like you can't touch it, you can't feel it, like it's not there. And a lot of the times people interchange those two words. They say brain instead of mind. They think they're both the same thing and they're not. So Dr. Lugans, uh, who's been a clinical psychologist for 35 years and an emotions theorist, and who studied under Julian Rotter and Jay Efren. Julian Rotter was uh, one of the one of the fathers of clinical psychology. He literally was a part of the group that developed it as a discipline. And so that literally, that's why we have therapy. So this guy knows what he's talking about. And he created this book. It's 1,200 pages, and it took me a year and a half to read. That's insane, right? And it's called The Physics of Emotioning. And what he was able to prove was that uh, the human mind is an emergent property that uh, adheres to the laws of fluid dynamics. What does that mean? So unfortunately, up until this point, we've kind of completely neglected the mind and not really understood it. So I have a bachelor's in biology and chemistry. And so that that gives me the authority in the background to speak on the brain and the body. And then also I've been studying the human mind for three years under Dr. Lukens, um, and I'm certified in his method. And so I have an understanding of the human mind as well. And so that gives me this really amazing and unique understanding of how the mind and the brain and the body all work together in this beautiful, intricate dance to make us do what we do. But she's not wrong with this comment. She's absolutely correct in the neurotransmitter of dopamine and how that relates to appetite 100%. But I'm going to highlight here how just because that is the truth doesn't mean it's the whole truth. And the fact that she's focusing on that is what's holding us back from understanding things like, let's say, eating disorders. So, um, number one, what she's explaining here is that um, I, I ingest Adderall and some certain, you know, chemical processes occur, the dopamine and the, you know, all of that. And, and then out comes my human behavior. I don't eat. As a result. If... Um, we were just to look at this specific human behavior. Actually, this, re this response of hers, this explanation would suffice because yes, that is correct. Dopamine does this. It acts on this. The appetite goes and boom, I don't want to eat anymore. What it doesn't explain is the mind part of it. So if we were to do an autopsy of the brain and cut it in half, you wouldn't see little white pieces of printed paper with your social security number on it, but you know that you have that inside your mind and we wouldn't see a map of New Jersey, but you may live there. And you kind of know your way around. And we obviously wouldn't see a picture of the meal that we decided not to eat because our Adderall kicked in. So the mind is taking and it's taking in all this information and computing it and it's storing it, um, but it's not stored in the brain. So let me just take a second here and explain um, the difference between like knowing that there's a high level of dopamine in the brain and what the actual experience of the person is. So we have two people and they are um, told, you need more sunshine. Um, it gives you a dopamine hit, go to the beach. So one is a young man and one of them is a mother. And the mother lost her son to a drowning at the beach. So they both go to the beach, they're both in the sun and the sun does its thing physiologically. It does give a dopamine boost, except for one of them has trauma from the loss of her son in the ocean. And so they both might register the same amount of dopamine levels 
Um, in fact, she might actually register more dopamine than he does just because of her biology. Um, she absorbs, you know, the sunlight in a different way or faster or whatever, and boom, she gets a, a bigger hit. Uh, that does not mean that she's happy at the beach. Yes, if she were in her backyard absorbing sun and she wasn't reminded of the fact that her son was um, killed at the beach, then the dopamine comes in and it also correlates to happiness. But you see how the mind remembers the trauma, the biology doesn't. And just because the biology is saying that like there is a level of dopamine in the body um, does not mean that it actually correlates to an experience of happiness inside the mind. So this is the same argument for the whole my biology made me do it thing with men who are aggressive um, and who rape. If we're boiling all of our behavior, our human behavior down to our neurochemicals and our hormones, um, we're giving ourselves a pass for that kind of stuff. So Dr. Lucan says, uh, testosterone is not a pardon for emotional or moral ignorance or ineptitude. And that's the truth. It's like, just because a male has more testosterone in their body, which does translate to more of aggressive tendencies does not mean that testosterone shuts down somebody's conscience. So um, what she's doing is making a category mistake, right? Where she's saying a lack of appetite due to ADHD meds has nothing to do with interest because she doesn't really understand the, the mind part of everything. It does play a significant role in the side effect of lack of appetite, and so does desire. So these are the nine basic emotions, according to Dr. Lukens. And basic emotions are like elements on a periodic table. Uh, hydrogen, oxygen, those are elements. But you take two hydrogen, one oxygen, you bring them together, and you get a molecule like water. So these emotions, which are fear, anger, sadness, disgust, guilt, shame, and then interest, desire, and joy. So fear and anger, fight or flight, built into us biologically. Sadness, built into us biologically. Um, and disgust, we have that built into us biologically too. Evolutionarily speaking, it keeps us from eating things that are bad for us, for consuming things that um, could kill us. You might be driven to eat it because you're hungry, but your disgust emotion triggers and it says, I must reject the consumption of this because this could actually cause me more harm than good. So see how hunger here also, like how disgust plays a role in hunger and whether or not we're going to go for something. Guilt and shame, they're not built into us inherently. They are actually emotions that we develop as a result of our ability, our development of language. And then interest, desire, and joy all built into us biologically as well. And interest and desire are the ones that play a significant role in this whole process that she believes um, is not uh, actually tied to interest. So while she's sitting over here and talking about the brain and how you know the chemical soup of it matters, now I would love her to explain to me what's the chemical soup and process of a human being, a young girl, let's say, who believes she's overweight when she's not. And so she decides she's going to go to her doctor and pretend to have ADHD in order to get prescribed Adderall because she knows it's an appetite suppressant with the intention to lose weight with the medication because diet and exercise are not working. There's, there's nothing to explain that behavior. So in this specific human behavior that I just described, the brain whole explanation does not suffice. The brain is not the only thing that matters here. And, and the neurotransmitters and our hormones don't matter um, all by themselves. So now how do I know what hunger is? How do I know what that means to me? Even the cavemen had some sort of mechanism to understand and to make hunger pains mean I must consume something. So what I'm explaining with the appetite suppressant side effect of Adderall and its um, connection to emotions is that yes, Adderall in, all the chemical stuff happens over here just like she says, but then it has to go through the mind. From the mind, interest, I used to have an interest eating. That was where, my, you know, I had an appetite before and now I don't. So I have an interest and, and I, sorry, and I should say desire to consume. Now I don't. So what we've just done was we've taken, you know, interest, let's say our interest in eating something was at a level eight, and we've literally decreased it. So yes, the chemicals played a role um, in you know this whole process, but what were they interacting with inside the mind to then go, burp, 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 oh, okay, and burp, out with the human behavior, if that makes sense. If we literally cross this out because she says that we should, we can't explain eating disorders. 
So now tell me how someone who has anorexia who is in severe pain in their stomach, like hunger pains, is able to mind over matter, not consume the food. And so with, with her explanation, someone might just say to themselves, uh, well, I'm not hungry, so I'm not going to eat. And what our explanation in, in encompassing the mind in this whole process does is um, it helps somebody who is going through that side effect to say, okay, mind over matter. I know that I am not physically hungry, but I'm the only person that's been here all day with myself. So I know I haven't eaten all day. I know I need to nourish myself. Let me eat a protein shake. So if, if we were just to boil it down to the chemical stuff, then people kind of have a pass for, you know, self-defeating behaviors. Uh, it helps people understand why they're not feeling hungry, but it doesn't help them tangibly 100% in their experience of living. It's like, okay, yeah, I know that if I go out in the sun, I'll have more dopamine and I'll feel better. But if I am severely emotionally depressed because I have so many emotional incompletions or unfinished emotional business, I'm not going to go into the sun to get the dopamine, to make myself feel better, to increase my mental health. The act, the very act of wanting to increase your mental health requires you to believe you deserve it. It requires you to believe that you want it. And if you don't want it, you're not going to go after it. So these explanations of these things don't actually give us the motivation to take care of ourselves.